Um, if you look, Marty likes to say that uh, that uh, Reeves developed the operation. And Reeves, I mean, that Stopa did. Stopa didn't develop this operation. Jean Reeves developed the operation. And if you look at Dr. Reeves' picture, he has suture fixation. This is through open. This is through an incision. He has suture fixation of the mesh, probably about 10 to 15 sutures, even along the psoas, even along the iliac vessels in that area. When Dr. Stopa did a unilateral preperitoneal open repair, he fixed the mesh. It was only with, whoops, we lost the, we lost the mic lost again. again. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. Anyway, with 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 unilateral mesh repair open, Stopa fixed the mesh. It was only with the giant, not great, giant reinforcement of the visceral sac that he recommended no fixation because of what Marty said, big the big piece of mesh. So if you're gonna do what Marty says, use a big piece of mesh. And in Dr. Taylor's study, which is a very good study that Marty showed, you've gotta read the discussion. It's only recommended for hernias less than two centimeters and the follow-up is only six months. And he says that's not long enough, and so you have to be careful. And go look at Dr. Kakuta's data, Dr. Schwab's data, and Dr. Kess's data, and you'll see the mesh move, so be very careful. Well, let's start off with some questions from the audience. We can't, the lights are so bright we can't see, so could you tell us your name when you, for you? Uh, Simon Bergman from Montreal. Okay. Uh, one of you showed a nice video of a strangulated uh, piece of bowel being pulled out of a, a hernia defect. Um, I'm assuming that was uh, that piece of the bowel was resected. Uh, how, how did you de then close the hernia, and do you feel comfortable putting mesh in these situations? So that, that would be my video, and I'll tell you about that case. We reduced that hernia, and I was under the impression when I started the case that the bowel was going to come back to life. So actually, I converted that case to a TEP, did the hernia repair with synthetic, went back and looked at the bowel when I was done, and it still had that violaceous look to it. So that was an interesting dilemma. What I basically did is pulled the bowel up through a small extended incision, did a small bowel resection, put it back together. Uh, when the pathology came back five days later as transmural ischemia, I was very glad I did that. Patient did great, no wound infection, no mesh infection. That's you know a unique scenario. I'm not saying that's how you want to do it, but that's, that's how that patient got treated. Another question from here, let, sir. Let me interject. Is there anybody on this? Anybody in this panel besides me would uh, disagree with that uh, approach? Well, you guys are brave, because what I would say is that you better wait to see if something's viable before you put in the permanent mesh, because otherwise you'll be in the conference I was just in next door, which is medical legal. I think <laughs> it, it's very important, and I'm actually involved in a case like that, is that you have to decide. He got away with it. But if he didn't get away with it, it'd be a lot of problems. So you really have to determine viability before you decide what to do, I think. Well, well Bruce, what's the data on, because uh, because I put synthetic mesh in contaminated situations, depending upon the contamination, what's the data with uh, contaminated synthetic mesh? Well, again, that's a complex situation. So there's no, there's no real data to draw on. You, I think most importantly, a scenario like that, is the discussion with the patient and the relationship you develop with the patient, talking to them ahead of time, what you might do and why, and then after the fact, going back and explain what you did and why and continue that discussion. But, but there is no data, good data, right? There's no good data, but you know, if you look at uh, Carl LeBlanc when he did a meta-analysis and he looked at the laparoscopic ventral hernia repairs and uh, with actually the mesh was placed inside the abdomen, not extraperitoneally, uh, the incidence of... Uh, of a uh, bowel injury was about 1.34 percent in the majority of those cases they hate, where there was uh, minimal spillage the author described placing the mesh inside the abdomen with good results and uh, and I know in the one study that I did uh, with Bruce and Guy we had 850 cases we had uh, 13 uh, bowel injuries six in the small intestine all of those small intestinal bowel injuries uh, there was no spillage in bowel and, and mesh was placed in all of Bruce's cases sorry Bruce <laughs> the, uh, and, but actually they went on to, they went on to do well I think the consideration in this is one is you know, we're not using the meshes that we've always used before and that the lighter, not to get too much into this, but the lighter weight meshes are less infectable. There's no question about it. And then the other thing that causes most of the infections is staph aureus causes over 90% of the mesh infections. And there's not a lot of staph aureus in the small intestine and I, so I think that, you know, the, you know and, and there is no prospective randomized study on, you know, small bowel injury with and without mesh. 
Uh, and, but I will tell you that you know, getting away with it, you know, we put mesh in the extra peritoneal space and you know, big, bad, open ventral hernia repairs and with a small bower section when there's no, when there's no spillage. And, uh, but we warn the patients ahead of time. That's the one difference. I think the key is where you put the mesh and in what situation. So in your situation, you chose to put it in a space separate from and distinct from the area of injury. So that was key. And I agree with lightweight meshes, you're, you're less prone to having that use of antibiotics uh, in that perioperative time to cover gram-negative bacteria in addition to gram-positive is important. And I certainly do not advocate putting in a synthetic mesh directly within the same compartment as a, as a contaminated field. But uh, if you can separate the compartments, I think that's the beauty of adding TEP instead of doing it as a top. So you, you don't think those bacteria go through the peritoneum? Well, I think if you put the mesh all again, <laughs> if you if you put the mesh against good vascularized tissue with the least amount of potential space, so tap as opposed to a tap, and in a separate compartment, the chance of you in infecting it from peritoneal translocation or uh, blood with the advent of antibiotics is low. Let me let me add, defend myself since I'm I'm <laughs> outnumbered here. Uh, the fact is. I, I wish that the companies who made the mesh would say the same thing because the disclaimer on the package says if you do a bowel resection or have, or have contamination, you can't put the mesh. So medically, legally, what will happen is someone will present that and then we're going to have to hire all you guys to defend all the guys that just did it that way and we'll hire you guys as the experts because we've got to get the companies to change what they allow us to do with with certain of these lightweight meshes. I think we got to get off of this topic because we got a lot of questions. So I'm just going to, I just want to caution though, that I don't think under any circumstances you put should mesh in the belly in contact with a bowel anastomosis. I don't think the audience should go away thinking you should do that. I'm sure those cases you're talking about, uh, Todd, are, are patients where there's big omentums and they can be able to s isolate it with omentum and get the bowel well away from the mesh. Can we put the, put the mesh extra pair? Yeah, if you put that, that would make a big difference too. But there's been studies in the laboratory where I mean, bowel anastomosis were wrapped with prosthetic material, and they all leak. 100 percent will leak if you wrap the anastomosis in a dog with with a saran wrap or some type of foreign material. Go ahead, you've been up for a long time, sir. Um, Kevin Powell from Atlanta. One question, or one thing that resonated through the talk was about experience versus inexperience. And for those of us that are newer at this, that have been out a couple of years, who may not have that that number, that 250 laparoscopic procedures, what do you recommend for us uh, as far as doing these procedures or continuing these procedures? Because I do a number of them. I don't think that I've got up to 250, I believe close, but um, are there any other recommendations that you have for those of us who have not done that many? I suppose I, I'd probably just comment on that first because the, the 250 number came from the VA study. Uh, and uh, it's now obvious that that's a ridiculous number. Um, and it had nothing to do with it. If you do 250 laparoscopic hernias poorly, you're going you're to do 500 <laughs> poorly. Uh, so the key is you, you've, got, you've got to get trained properly. And then I, I fully think 25 is plenty if you learn properly. And you can, you don't continue. I, I disagree with that. I totally disagree with that. 25 is not plenty in my mind. Uh, uh, I, I still learn something every time, and uh, what that magic number is, I don't know, but I don't think it's 25. I, I, if you talk to our fellows, they can do a gastric bypass in 25 cases, but they can't do a laparoscopic, you know, e e one that's even reasonably complex laparoscopic anal hernia repair in 25 cases. They feel more confident doing a spleen or an adrenal uh, at 25 than at lap anal. I have three residents here in the audience. I'll have them come up and tell you what they... <laughs> my, my two cents about experience is there's a difference between experience and being an expert, and you develop experience every single day that you operate, and one day you sort of just cross into that threshold where you actually feel confident. But it helps along that way if you have somebody else to mentor or at least ask an opinion of. I don't think any of us should take on cases completely alone in the early period of training. And I think having a mentor around, because I didn't learn alone, uh, it was really key to getting past that learning curve and understanding exactly what I was doing on each case. I would just like to say for the residents that I think that they can just scrub in on a, t on a tap or top and just do it before having really <coughs> seen much, should go to, uh, go to the Netherlands, Dr. Yeekel's group in the Netherlands. You have to hold camera for a thousand inguinal hernias <laughs> before you're allowed to actually perform the procedure. That sounds like slave labor more than <laughs> learning. But their residency is 26 years long. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you have a question out there, please? Can you, can you? Can you tell us your name? That'd be great. Amir Sultan. 26-hour work week. <laughs> <laughs> I, Amir Sultan from Tel Aviv. Uh, just a comment. Uh, 
first of all, I, th I thought it was a wonderful uh, session, and it seems that there was really no debate because all of you said that tacking or not tacking or tap or taps are equally good. So it actually gives us a lot of freedom to choose what we think is nice for us, which is, I think, good. Um, about the cost uh, issue uh, that was raised uh, by the people who discussed TAP, I think that the use of balloon for TAP is really not necessary. I think that we were used, we got used to do it because somebody made a great effort to sell us this balloon, but uh, it's, uh, it takes you about five minutes to learn uh, the technique for doing the same operation exactly without a balloon and save $300, which I think is going to be an issue, for, especially for you guys in the coming few years. Uh, yeah, but that, that's your experience. And, and Dr. Sol, you're a very talented surgeon. You carry that over. It's like Marty and I many years ago, where were we in South America? Marty and I were in South America, and Marty went first, and he was saying you don't need a balloon. A balloon's a waste of money. He had a primary hernia. Changed. He had he had a primary hernia, and then I followed him. This was live surgery. I followed him with a recurrent hernia, and I we timed how how long it took him to make the space, and it I forget the time, but it was significant. It to get the, to where he was ready to start actually dissecting and get his mesh in place, and if and it wasn't two minutes, it was much longer than that. Well, that's OR time. And so if you're going to compare that, you, m you must look at OR time. And, I put when, and I've done it both ways, and, and I, th I think you're exactly correct. But uh, when you look at the balloon and how quickly you can create that space, it's quicker than manual dissection for the average surgeon. Maybe not for you, Dr. Zolt, because you're very good. Well, I will, I will make a comment. Uh, I think the, the speed, that really depends on what you're trying to demonstrate. If you're given something there, demonstrating something new, you take a little, a little more time. But I think you can do it just about as fast. And you, d you didn't that day. No, I agree. You didn't that day. <laughs> I wanted, and I afterwards, and afterwards, you don't remember this, you came up and said, I need to look into that balloon. That's exactly what <laughs> yeah. I said. Uh, uh, there, there, is one, there is one randomized study, I don't have it before me, but there is one randomized study comparing balloon, no balloon, and experienced surgeons who did it both ways, and there was a significant time saving by using the balloon in their hands. So you have to weigh the cost of which costs more. That's the only difference. Okay, a question from over here, sir. Jay Bikshandani from Creighton, Omaha, and uh, I have a question which is pertaining to Dr. Fitzgibbon's uh, first patient. I have the opportunity to work with him as a resident, and uh, this is for Dr. Wohler. Sir, if this patient comes to uh, a, a relatively young surgeon outside working, uh, what would you have offered this patient? Would you offer, uh, uh, like somebody who doesn't have 250 cases, would you still offer uh, a laparoscopic repair to him, or would you go ahead with what Dr. Fitzgibbon believes to, go, uh, to give open repair? The botanist? Yeah. You're talking about the botanist? Yeah. 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 Uh, if you're that surgeon, you offer him what you're comfortable with. And if you're comfortable with the laparoscopic <laughs> approach, you give him that option. If you're comfortable with the open, you give him that option and let the patient decide. But uh, you have to be upfront with your experience. If you're not comfortable with the laparoscopic, get proctored, get mentored, get whatever it takes. But uh, it's whatever you're comfortable with. I think after working with Dr. Fitzgibbon, I am comfortable with both. Well, the question is, if I am comfortable uh, looking at what you think, would you uh, go ahead and offer him laparoscopic? Oh, hell yes. <laughs> That's what Thank I... You. Okay, Jay. Can, I, can okay. I ask a question of the audience? Yes. When, uh, for those who raised your hand that do laparoscopy, how many do TEP? And, and how many do TAP? And how many use a routine Foley catheter? And how many do not? See, that I think is a little interesting because the, the, one of the debates we didn't get into is the routine use of Foley catheters during laparoscopy. And, and I found it, that it was about 50-50. Yeah. Um, but I think, again, when there is a safer option, I tend to go with the safer option, which is if you're going to have the risk of a bladder injury and you don't have a Foley, you're sort of more liable than if you have it with. But, well, well, but, but the uh, reason uh, I'm asking uh, is stop, this has stop, to do with Stop, 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 stop. Okay. You no. young guys. You don't read the literature. You just go on your own experience. You got to read. You know, <laughs> the fact is no, that, wait a that no, wait a minute. that's no, wait been a minute. looked at, and, and foley's are more likely to cause no. problems post op. No, no there was post op. Post op. Post op. But but interoperatively, you got to pee. They got to pee. You, you, See, now we got a debate. You need to pee. You have trouble with that. <laughs> the <laughs> the. <laughs> the if you want to overlap your direct defect in all directions, 
well. There is no way you can do it over Cooper's and over the pubic tubercle over Cooper's without a deflated bladder because your anesthesiologist has that IV wide open. The bladder will be flush with Cooper's ligament, and you're not going to get the mesh will be on the bladder. The mesh needs to be down over the bone, not on the bladder. In addition, bladder, bladder injuries, if you put the Foley in, uh, and I don't know that this is true, but I think it's interesting. If you use the balloon to create your space and you inflate that balloon and you have a 10 cc Foley balloon in there, I think maybe the shear between those two can create some problems. If you put a Foley in, I've always used five cc's, no more, because when you put 10 cc's, you'll see a very large balloon sitting there in that bladder. So I don't recommend that, but I, 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 uh, it does cause more problems post-op in old men. And, uh, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I'll be glad. Phil, to, Phil wants to say. But I'll tell you, you, guy, with the, as far as using a Foley, you, and, and we do a lot of taps. We do some, uh, a lot of taps. We do some taps. You know, we put, don't put a Foley in anybody, and you know, we've not had a bladder injury. You don't need to do that. But one thing you need to do is you need to talk to anesthesia and the people who. Get, when we've looked at it, we looked at over uh, 1,250 cases, and the people who had trouble urinating after surgery, the number one predictor of that is somebody who got over 800 cc's of IV fluids. And you know, and quite honestly, why do you even need an IV, IV fluids when people come in for a you know 40 minute operation? I mean, they need they need a, a 250 cc bag of IV fluids, and that's it. And then they just they do give them enough IV fluids to induce them. And if they need a little drugs, if they drop their blood pressure a little bit on induction, but otherwise they need to hang a 250 cc bag of IV fluids and be done with it. And then you don't need, I mean, you run two liters of IV fluids and the bladder gets over distended. And by the time they get over their anesthesia, they, they, they can't compress. And then you got a, then you got somebody who's going to spend the night or go home with a Foley or something like that. Well, Bob, Bob, it was your resident that showed the amount of overlap you needed of the defect with your mesh. Is that correct? Yes. And what was that? Two centimeters? Oh, I think it was more than that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That was a long time ago. That was Loham. Yeah, but it was a significant amount yes. in all directions, correct? Yes. Okay. Okay. I think we, got, we better take the second microphone first, then, then you. Hi, Sebastian Dimitinier from Montreal. I was just wondering, I'd like to pa poll the panel. If you have a recurrence after a tap, what is your primary approach for that? Tap, tap, or open? Did you right. say your primary recurrence right. after, after a tip? tip. That's do, right, I recurrence do, after a tip. I, I do a Lichtenstein. Open. Yeah. I do a transabdominal preperitoneal. Uh, I'm old and tired. I avoid scar tissue, a Lichtenstein repair. I would do a Lichtenstein unless there was a very early recurrence. I've done a tap. I like to see what the mechanism is. I, I'm young and energetic, and I'd still do a Lichtenstein. <laughs> <laughs> I'd sort of do you said you were young. So it's not age related. <laughs> you said you're young. You're next, sir. Yeah, um, I was going to make a comment so about this uh, uh, <laughs> exposure issue and whether you, whether or not you use the uh, uh, catheter. And what I've found, what we do routinely is, of course, I have the luxury of having the same crews for all my cases. So they take all the patients to the restroom before going. And we prep the perineum completely. So that if we have any difficulty uh, seeing Cooper's or the pubic tubercle, which is the first step of the operation, the uh, section, we could selectively place a catheter on the table. And so I would say that we probably have to do that uh, one in a hundred, and that avoids that situation. One other comment, please. It was only touched on briefly earlier about uh, the different, you know, the, the advantage of tap versus tap. And I realize that I can't convince a lot of people to come back to TAP that are in the TEP area. But in my experience, and I've done quite a few, and uh, I can tell you that I've been able to diagnose uh, several cancers and several significant problems that people have on perusing the abdomen with the scope prior to starting the case. So I think that this is something that needs to be in that mix. Along with the ease of diagnosing the other side, which you cannot do, it's impossible to do with the TEP without the second. Thank you. Okay. We're getting close to the end of the time, so we'll take one more question here. Yes, Alessio Pigazzi from Los Angeles. Uh, I, I work in a center that does over 1,000 robotic prostatectomies a year, and we are seeing a true epidemic of post-prostatectomy inguinal hernias. We estimate it's about 10%. Considering the numbers that I've done nationwide, I'm sure that that is the experience of many in the audience. And I've done over 200 inguinal, laparoscopic inguinal hernia repairs, uh, and, uh, and uh, I tried for a couple of years to 
do the post prostate, post robotic prostate in our hernias laparoscopically. And uh, although we were successful about 30% of the time, the stress level was such that it simply wasn't mm -hmm. worth it. And so I've completely given up that operation. And I was wondering, and I think that it would probably be best to recommend that although they can technically be done, it's probably foolish to make a hole in the bladder and, and ruin the robotic procedure, trying to do one of those procedures laparoscopically. And the other thing that I wanted to ask is, a lot of these patients, after they have their inguinal hernia repair, have better urinary function. Have you guys seen that? And if so, do you know what the mechanism? We see it frequently. They seem to have uh, lower incontinence rates. Anybody have any experience with post prostatectomy or your repairs? Post -robotic I've seen that as well, and I uh, haven't been able to answer that question because the patients would tell me I can urinate better now and don't have my incontinence and don't know why. How many, how many up here besides yeah. Sharon would do the post prostate laparoscopically? You got two young ones, and how about yeah. the old guys? New buddy. As I got older, I went from tap to tap, though. Thank you. But I agree with him. You shouldn't do it unless you're Bruce Ramshaw or well, Brian it, or Sharon. It can be done, and at the American Hernia Society last week, a fellow from New Zealand presented 72 cases after uh, radical prostate uh, with no complications. Yeah. And the key that he said, and which I still won't I'll stick to open, and I don't do very many open hernias, is that if you go from lateral to medial, you, have to, you can't use a balloon and you must dissect the lateral first. And he made it look like a piece of cake in his video, but uh, must be something different about the sheep and the New Zealanders. <laughs> <laughs> what I will say about technique is that you can get into that space, not through the midline, but by going underneath the rectus muscle. And so I'll take my incision and come off to the side and go down along the, the, the rectus muscle that's on the opposite, or actually I'm sorry, the ipsilateral rectus muscle where I'm going to operate and start that way and then work one way over. And, you know, the, 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 the real problems that you get into are just really, really around the, the tubercle. And you just got to be very careful. And if you don't know what the structure is or doesn't feel right, don't, don't rip it or cut it. Just leave <laughs> it there. And then if you're getting into real trouble, then go, go inside and see what the story is. And you can always abort or do an open if you really are in trouble. But I'll start by going under the rectus. Yeah, I agree. It's not something that should be advocated across the board. But certainly uh, with robotic prostatectomy, they're very low uh, when it gets when they do their their uh, their bladder takedown, and so the the space at which their scar tissue and where we are uh, doesn't necessarily overlap by that much. So I think um, with the appropriate techniques, you can do it. But once again, not for everyone. And, and this might be a case of like I have a guy. I frequently will do them open, and uh, just just to not violate that space in an opening or hernia repair. And you got someone who's even relatively thin. You can do them with local anesthesia and, and those benefits. But the, the, I certainly agree with starting lateral and coming immediately. Uh, but frequently, where they're worried, the bladder will see that the bladder is really dropped down really low. And so you can get to the lateral edge of the pubis and, and on to, to toward the, the mid, of the mid uh, portion of the pubis, and the bladder's even out of your field. And so uh, the last couple that we've done, uh, that's what we found. I mean, it's, it's just a matter of your, your one, how many of these you've done, and then your, your tolerance for, your, for pain. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we're pretty much out of town, uh, time. I think we've covered a lot of ground here, and uh, uh, I think we've all learned a lot. I appreciate the, all the help of the panel. <laughs> Thank you guys, it was a pleasure.